So I read that I know that um, I read that your uncle went to both the Winter and Summer Olympics. Did he help decide which Olympics that you wanted to compete at? Uh, ish. So for me, it was more more Sydney. Watching Sydney uh, when I was nine, ten, ten was kind of what really drove that Olympic drive. Initially, I wanted to be a sprinter, like Uncle Paul, um, and compete in the Summer Olympics. And then the older I got, the more I kind of realised that that was probably not going to happen. So then it was a case of trying to find another way to, to still get to the Olympics. So the Uncle Paul competing in the summer and winter definitely had that um, thought, like put the thought in the back of my head about both of them. Um, but it wasn't until much later that I really went, yeah. let's try Bob's Um, And so obviously you compete um, in skeleton. What is it um, that you love about it? It's just, it's fun. Like as a, as a kid, I always like going head first up down the water slides, and now I get to do that on ice and go faster than we can legally drive cars. Um, yeah, like the the days when it goes right, you feel like you're flying, and <laughs> it's just the best the like, the best feeling ever. Yeah, and I think I think you said before quickly that um you were in like a bobsled um like team um and in 2011 that you met the national like skeleton coaches and they convinced you to make the switch. And I know you said that you like kind of going head first down things like water slides, but I want you, I want to know how they convinced you to join a sport where you go head first at like 150 kilometers per hour with no brakes. Um, in the end, it was curiosity got the better of me. So I spent two and a half months bobsledding because I figured I, I needed, well, I wanted to give that, get a, give that a shot and see if that was going to be an option. And then I managed to convince my dad to let me go back over to the US once I got home from that. And a couple of runs from halfway down the track in the US. And I was like, nah, I'm done. I can see where I'm going. It's fun. I'm mostly in control of the sled. <laughs> although, although not at that point. And I've seen that in skeleton before you can get on the, is it, do you call it the skeleton like bobsled kind of thing? No, just a uh, sled. A oh, sled. <laughs> um, yeah. If, um, you have to run for like 15 seconds, like I think for 50 meters before you can um, get started to get speed. How much of your training is just spent like practicing the start? Do you ever trip over? <laughs> um, so answer your second question first. Yes, I have fallen over uh, a couple of times. We were in Cal on my first season and I kicked to the side of the sled and oh. then that set me doing like a, like a forward roll over it. Thankfully, it's not on camera. At home, like over summer, I've got a, a push sled that, that my husband built. So I do a little bit of pushing on that, but most of it is sprinting and gym work to try and get myself as powerful and as fast as I can. Um, we're not fortunate enough to have well, a push track at Oz anyway, um, but even in the UK, there's there's no um, ice house, which some of the other countries have. And the, the Canadians are in their ice house every couple of days from like, from July kind of onwards, um, which you know, would be nice, yeah. <laughs> but it is what it is. So um, like I said, you can kind of control the, the start of the race by sprinting and um, being good at getting on the sled quickly. How do you train for the rest of the course since you're mainly just lying down with your like body kind of squished together? Um, a lot of it is prior preparation. So we do a lot of track walks, walking down the track and having a look at the, the corners. Um, and knowing and understanding what they do and what they're, well, what, what they are going to want to do the sled and then how we need to manipulate like, the sled to go as fast as we can. Um, it's more, more trying to work with the track. A lot of it is video as well. Um, and, uh, mind runs to so try and mentally rehearse what we're going to do because we don't tend to get a lot of time on time actually doing our sport, even in winter. I um, read or I heard that it um, said that you can't, you can only kind of do the kind of track like up to three times a day or your body just can't like handle it. It de depends on the track and depends on the person. So some of the easier tracks, well, I'll rephrase that. Some of the lesser uh, G-force tracks you can do, yeah, at three, depending on uh, maybe four. Um, but on some of the higher G tracks, then for me, two runs is plenty. So we're talking... Two minutes on ice a day. Wow. <laughs> yeah. When you're standing at the top of your run or the course, what are you thinking about? 
Uh, <laughs> during training, there's there'll be a, a couple of key key focus points that I need to that I'm working on. Um, but on race day, it's more trying to clear my brain and just put myself into that into the, uh, a clear clear mindset so that I can feel what what's going on. The the more I think down the track, <laughs> the, the worse I slide. Um, and when you're presented um, in this sled, you wear a helmet, but you're, you're kind of facing down. How much of, or well, how much can you actually see? Uh, not a whole lot <laughs> on when we're at the start and in corners where um, your head's not buried. You can probably see five meters maybe ish. Wow. Maybe down the um, you get, get more of a view when you're going downhill and, between corners so you can like, as you're coming out of one corner you can then see where you're going to the next corner yeah but when you're in some of the higher g corners my, my face is buried and i see absolutely nothing except for the ice like straight under my head when you're there your head is like almost touching the ground and so are your feet i mean i've seen that you kind of sometimes use your feet to kind of steer um I, i'm i don't know what the question really is out of that but do you ever um does your helmet ever get like scratched or something because it's like touching the ice? Oh yeah, all the time. I've got tape on my helmet because otherwise, if I didn't, then there'd be there'd be no paint left. Some of my some of the other girls who compete are always dragging dragging their heads. And actually, there's mate put up something in, on Instagram this morning that she's lost all the paint off, off the off her chin just from a couple of runs. I read an article talking about the effects that like skeleton has on your body. Um, and also mentally, and that you can't really do more than three months per day, like I said um, earlier, or it's too much for the body to handle. Um, and you said that it's kind of true for some courses. Um, and, and since you've been doing this sport for like a decade, what kind of long, long-term long effects does it have um, on your physical health? Physical, not so much just yet. Um, I, that being said, I've had three concussions and the last one was pretty bad. So the the head injuries and we call it call it sled head, which is I, I think what you're kind of referring to. Um, and people are starting to take that slightly more seriously. So as we get further through the season, I notice um, sometimes it's hard for me to like find the right word for things. Everything is a little bit blur. Well, wait, yeah, it's, it's more more for me like the like words and thinking and that just, it just slows down your brain almost goes into a bit of a fog. Yeah. Um, but then you come out of that and it's, it's a lot of it is managing it and knowing your body and being willing to take a step back when things don't quite feel right. Um, and I, did you say at the beginning that you, um, you didn't, you did like, you wanted to do summer sports like you did, I think athletics it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. um what was, so I, um, you know what warming up is like for those kind of track um things where probably a lot of running and things. But is warming up different um for you guys since you've you're like racing in freezing weather? Uh, look, warming up for us <laughs> everywhere except for China is in car parks. So it's I do my normal sprint warm up because at the like at the beginning we are sprinting, um, but it's in it's on frozen car parks snow sometimes ice depending on where, where we are and what the weather's like um if yeah if it's if it's warm enough it'll be like bitumen um and then otherwise it'll be snow china though finally they've sorted everything out and we have a nice big indoor area that we can warm up so we will actually be warm double concept <laughs> A lot of people have probably heard about skeleton, but maybe don't know like what's involved from an athletic perspective. What do you think is the biggest incorrect assumption that people make about it? That we lie there and do nothing. <laughs> That's what everyone everyone thinks we do. <laughs> what you've said, it's definitely definitely more than that. And I was um, watching a bit of it earlier and I was just, it's it's because it looks really simple. And I saw that, um, the track's really, is the track really bumpy? Because it looked really um, bumpy and they said it looks really smooth, but it's not. Some of them are. Um, 
there's a couple of tracks that are notorious for being really bumpy. Uh, Eagles in Austria is one of them. The last couple of corners in Winterberg in Germany, which is where we're going to next, is again notorious for it. Um, but yeah, like the, I think what doesn't help with the like that assumption that we do nothing is because on the runs that that, that look like well, when we do it when we do it properly and we do it well, it does look like we're doing nothing because nothing moves. <laughs> but that's not definitely not the case. Yeah. It's all short yeah. Things. yeah. Like you said, you you kind of like walking through the track and you kind of do need to get everything perfect because. You can't steer, but you can do small things to, like, make it go. Because if you were doing nothing, then I guess you would kind of, the slide would go everywhere. Yeah, it'd, it'd move a lot more than what it does. So we can, we've got a fair amount, well, yeah, a fair amount of control. Not as much as what bobsled or lose do, but we can still have a pretty good pretty good uh, impact on, on where the sled goes. Which I guess is good. Um, uh, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Um, are you able to like explain the adrenaline rush you get from doing a skeleton run? The only thing I can kind of compare it to would be like the free fall from skydiving, and that, that's because I that's because I've gone skydiving. <laughs> um, it's it's really hard to compare it to. Like the the start, I guess, would be kind of like going down. A hill on a skateboard, you kind of get that that sense, particularly if you're lying on a skateboard. Yeah, not a good idea. But <laughs> maybe with a helmet on, not too bad. Uh, but the, the the speed of it is really hard to gauge unless you're on something similar. Maybe not necessarily going the same speed, but <laughs> but on a sled on a sled going going downhill. Yeah, because um, like you said, you are um, you like the. Or it was um you're kind of going faster than like a car faster than most cars except it's kind of just you on a well, tiny little sled and you well there's walls that you could crash into and fall over so yeah yeah, yeah. thankfully with with Skelly when, when we hit a wall we tend to just bounce off <laughs> so it's not that bad and most of us girls we fit inside of our sled so there's there's metal bumpers that sit on the outside of our sled which for most of us thankfully they take the hit. Some of the boys uh, sit outside of that, so they hit the wall. But for the most part, most of the time, it looks worse than it actually is. Yeah, it does. It because you're going so fast, it does look pretty painful. But you probably don't even notice that much sometimes. It d- depends on how smooth the wall is, which I know sounds silly. Um, but in Saint Moritz in Switzerland, which is where we're going, it's our last qualification race. It's the only national track in the world, and the wall there are like razors they're so sharp because it's just it's snow and ice and they don't shave the walls oh. whereas on some of the other tracks they're a little bit smoother so it's not quite so bad <laughs> um do you ever get scared before either going down or while you're on the actual course there's been a couple of times i think maybe not scared but definitely nervous particularly down uh whistler in canada which is the fastest track in the world that one's nerve wracking, definitely. Um, I think partly too because you know the consequences of what's going to happen and how much is going to hurt when you don't get it right. Um, and those those first runs back are, are always nerve wracking to try to figure or hope that you remember how to, how to slide. But being scared on a run, don't think so nervous definitely particularly when i put myself in a position where i know i'm gonna crash that's not that's not particularly fun <laughs> but yeah more more nervous i think than scared yeah um, like i said i think i was watching um some um old skeleton races earlier and there's often split like really tiny seconds between coming like um first second or fourth and fifth so what um usually makes someone better on the um well I guess better than the others like a fastest sprint or like even a better sled? Yeah, so a, a, a lot of it is start, but then you've also got the equipment, um, different different runners, different sleds, but then also who can be the most relaxed and kind of get out of the sled's way 
and that that has a lot to do with it. Just a lot of times you'll see people hitting walls, but they'll still get they'll still get time. Yeah. Because yeah. they're so relaxed and it's just flowing and going well. It feels like a bit of um winter athletes have forgotten that um um about in Australia compared to like the big sports. Um like like it feels like um winter athletes are often forgotten about like um in terms of like summer athletes. Um what do you think could be done to change that? I think I think social media is helping a lot, but part of it, I guess, is also the mainstream media kind of maybe helping. Think at this time around, it it hasn't helped that Tokyo was only was only six months ago. Yeah. Usually, there there's enough of a gap that everyone goes, "Oh yeah, that's right, the Winter Olympics." Despite the fact that we are quite good good in, in some events, like our aerial skiers and mobile skiers are unreal even like our skis and snowboarders. So it's not like we're not winning medals or anything like that. It's we're really competitive, but I think because it's, it's almost a bit of a novelty and everyone's like, Oh, like when we're not, not any good at that. It's just part of it. I think is, is a cultural thing. And because we are such a summer dominated country. Yeah. That it's just, it, it is what it is. And like where, we're doing a bit, particularly the the skiers and snowboarders trying to trying to get it out there, but it's not it's not really a mainstream sport in Oz. And I think it's it's similar, I guess, to maybe the Canadians and because they're from what I understand from talking to to friends, they're the other way around. Like their their winter Olympians are the ones who are kind of all over the place, and their summer guys tend to get a little bit forgotten about. <laughs> Whereas for us, it's the other way around. Um, the winter Olympics are. I, I feel like there's a, a, a bigger variety of sports and they're all really different. And I think they're really actually exciting to watch. People crash more often. <laughs> and like it's it's far more exciting because you've got like the like snowboard half pipe and like that. You've got people doing tricks ridiculously high in the air or going stupidly fast down a track. It's just it's chaos and it's so much fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. This is also kind of off topic that I saw that on your Instagram. Um, you were making some kind of furniture for, I think, a course that you were doing. Um, like, what what kind of um, was that or what were you doing? Uh, so I'm doing, I'm studying, uh, well, doing an interior design course online at the moment. Um, but I think I was building something at home. Um, just any, I, I, quite, I quite like getting my hands dirty and, and doing kind of DIY stuff. I'm learning, I'm slowly getting better at it. <laughs> But it's I don't I just doing stuff stuff with my hands I quite like whether that's building or I don't know, I haven't really painted but yeah it did, did a bit of like renovation stuff on just random things that <laughs> that we bought for our for our, for our place it's um, fun is that something um you kind of want to have as a job or focus on after you finish competing yeah um. So I did just sports science at uni before I started before I started skeleton, and then the last couple of last year discovered interior design, and it's so much fun. It's a nice nice change from being an athlete, which I I, I love being an athlete, but it's nice to go get, go down a path that's completely different to that, and let sport just go back to being sport and being fun and being a love and not necessarily being a job. Yeah. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to having, having both <laughs> and yeah, it'll be good. Would you have any advice for kids playing sport? Don't take it too seriously. Put the, put the, the hard work in, like when, when you're at training, really be at training and, and focus, but it has to be fun. Like enjoy, enjoy being at training, training with your friends and enjoy all of it. I, I learned so much playing sport as a kid and it, it's, yeah, right. It is good for you from a, from a health, health point of view, but it's just, yeah, have fun, work hard. And it does, doesn't matter what level you're trying to get to just do the best you can. And that will be enough. Yeah. That's probably good advice for me because I, I get very competitive doing sport, but I guess if you're having more fun, you're going to all get better because you're going to want to keep doing it. Yeah, and making mistakes is, is a good thing. That's how you learn and that, that's how you get better. So don't beat yourself up 
as hard as it is for making the mistakes. So there'll always be a lesson that you can learn from that. And if you can go in with that, with that mindset, then I think a you'll improve faster, but then you can take some of the pressure off yourself and say, okay, well I made a mistake. It sucks. It hurts, but we move forward and we get better. Being, being competitive is not, not a bad thing, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you hope winter sports um, will look like in 10 years' time? I hope we've still got a program um, from, a, from, a, from a skeleton point of view. I hope, I hope we've got coaches and we've got athletes who are still competing on the world stage and who are, who are good. There, there's no reason why, as a country, we can't be great at this. We... Hopefully there'll be there'll be more funding, a push track, <laughs> maybe a little bit even more like some more recognition. Um, just yeah. Um, Hopefully I'm not the last girl. What do you hope um, skeleton will look like in ten years' time? I'd love to see it try and evolve, and there's a I'd love to see Team Relay come in. So we've kind of got it at the moment, but Luge do it really well. Um, where they have a they've got like a little paddle that they hit at, at the at the end of their run, and that sends the green light to the top of the track for the next sled to go. So I'd love to see that kind of brought in somehow because there's there's no reason why we can't do that. You just yeah. might just take a little bit of logistics, um, but yeah, bring in a proper team relay and make it a bit more spectator friendly somehow. I'm not quite sure how we do that, but whether it's like building new tracks down the side of a, like a ski hill, maybe, maybe shorten a little bit. I don't know. There's, we need to change it somehow to make it a bit more spectator and sponsor friendly. I haven't seen a, um, well, I guess a relay, but it does sound pretty fun. It brings in so many different variables and takes out so much of the routine that like everyone has their own set routine about, okay, well, the green light goes and they take so long to do everything else. But if you know you've got to you've got to take off, at the second that li- that light goes green, it just brings in so many different variables, and like break- breaking them becomes a skill, starting becomes more of a skill. It'd be so much more exciting, and then people would stuff it up too, because you'd get people like, people going like trying to anticipate it and go too fast, or just completely stuffing it up. It'd be great. Yeah. <laughs>